Topbed Talk. It is my great pleasure to introduce Andy Shaw, uh, who's one of the Brits that left Britain to go to uh, other pastures. So he trained at Barts, uh, and then by way of the Hammersmith and the Brompton and Harefield, ended up at MD Anderson. Uh, and then to Duke, where he became a professor, and then went to Vanderbilt. He does move house a lot, I have to say. Uh, went to Vanderbilt uh, and became a vice chair, and chair meaning something a bit different in America in that they're, they're actually in charge of stuff, unlike us professors in the UK. So they have big budgets and... Uh, look after both the the academic and the clinical piece of the department, and then most recently moved to Canada, to Alberta, where he is the chair. Uh, He's a great friend of... uh, Well, he's a good friend of mine. He's a great friend of uh, Ed Poms. He's been to a number of our meetings. He's, uh, as you have heard before, he's on the pokey board. Uh, He's also the president-elect of the SCA, so the Society for Cardiovascular Anesthesia in the the United States. Uh, And I was going to say something else nice about you, but I've forgotten. He's actually, uh, according to Google Scholar, you're the most highly cited person in perioperative medicine. There you go. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce Andy uh, to, to present the Ernest Henry Starling Lecture. Thanks a lot, Andy. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very aware of the fact that this is the last thing, so you guys have come to hear what I've got to say, and I'm um, a little nervous about that, but... Um, Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and and talk. Uh, This is probably my um, favourite international and uh, national scientific meeting. It's it's fabulous. I've been coming for many years. A lot of the stuff I'm going to present today was presented here first. And um, and it really is a treat. So thank you very much. Um, I am an anaesthetist and an intensivist. Well, I was an anaesthetist, then I became an anaesthesiologist... And now I currently work in Canada, I'm an anaesthetist again, so that's kind of nice. But I do, I do actually do the job as well. I'm in the operating room two days a week, and I'm in the intensive care unit 12 weeks a year, of which four weeks are nights. So um, I hope that's, uh, that's some sort of ongoing clinical credibility. These are my disclosures, none of them are relevant for this talk. Um, but I am an American as well as a Brit. And today is the 4th of July, so if I have any fellow American citizens, happy 4th. Um, it all started on the July the 4th, 1776. I'm not going to dwell too much. Things have, things have become a little interesting, depending on which side you look at this, uh, look at this particular uh, country's political system at the moment, so I'm not going to make any more comments about that. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you a picture of both my passports, though. My wife actually has three passports. She's Australian as well. Um, we do tend to move a little bit, as Mike uh, said. Um, and as I said, just on Top Med Talk, not just now, I, I'm running ahead of Epic installations. Everywhere I go, they in, seem to want to install Epic, and Alberta is no, uh, is no different. Someone that didn't have to deal with Epic, however, was uh, Dr. Ernest Henry Starling, and we're here today to talk about a little bit about uh, Professor Starling, and, and, I, and he's best known for four, four big discoveries. He was an extraordinarily prolific writer, uh, and publisher, um, pub- and he died around about Downton Abbey time, to put it into sort of historical perspective. Um, best known for, in our world perhaps, for two things, water balance in capillaries and the action of the heart as a pump, and I'll make a few comments about both of those. But he also discovered secretin and coined the term hormone, um, and he also discovered the presence of a substance that was in fact vasopressin and, and, and noticed it had an antidiuretic effect. Here is a picture of Dr. Starling. Um, uh, early on in his investigative career. So a little bit about him. Starling was an overachiever right from the beginning. He went to medical school shortly after his O-levels or whatever they were doing around about the time that you're 15, 16. Um, Graduated as a doctor and then went to Heidelberg to work with Professor Kuhn studying lymph flow. And it was during his lymphatic studies that he started to wonder and think about what is the physiology behind edema formation. When he came back to Guy's, he opened uh, the first physiology lab there and, and went on to describe what we now call Starling's forces in order to explain the generation of edema in tissues. Um, in great style, he then married his physiology teacher's daughter in 1891, and they worked uh, together for a, for a number of years. She actually became his lab manager. And then at the age of 33, think about what those of you who are 
uh, over the age of 33. You don't, don't need to feel inadequate now. But he was appointed professor at UCL and, and in that same year was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. And then in 1905, he worked, he kept it in the family, uh, as I said just now, with his brother-in-law, William Bayliss, also at, U- at UCL. As I just said, he described the term secretin, uh, the, the substance secretin, called it a hormone and, and started the entire discipline, therefore, of endocrinology. In 1910, Starling, alongside William Osler, appeared in front of the Haldane Commission and spoke very eloquently and forcefully about the need for science in medical education programs and, and doctors' education, and I think contributed a large, in large part to the, the development of the transition of medicine from an art to a science. And I think, uh, hopefully, that, that spirit of... Uh, of consideration for science has continued uh, to this day, and, and this meeting certainly is one of the uh, one of the meetings that's contributed to that. 1910 to 1912, perhaps for us, were his golden years. He described uh, his law of the heart, and he figured this out using a dog heart preparation. And as you know, independently, Otto Frank was working on the same problem using a prep in frog myocardium, and so we now refer to. Here, of course, we talk about Starling's law of the heart, but the rest of the world talks about the Frank Starling law. Um, and then in 1915, he, developed, he delivered the eponymous lecture in, in honour of the first president of the Royal College of Physicians, Thomas Lineker, whose picture actually is on the wall at the University of Padua alongside Walsingham and uh, Harvey, a couple of other British overachievers. Um, and he delivered the Lineker lecture at Cambridge on the law of the heart. Uh, there's a little bit... I was trying to find a way to link Starling to something American, and it turns out that there is a link. And um, August Crowe, who was a Danish physiologist, was awarded the Nobel for his work on capillaries and capillary function in 1920. And around about that time, a young physician anesthesiologist called Henry Beecher was working in Crowe's lab. And you may not, may not know that uh, Beecher was subsequently appointed the Henry Isaiah Dorr Professor of Anesthesia at MGH, which was the first chair of anesthesia anywhere in the world. And very interestingly, and a little bit controversially, Starling was overlooked for the Nobel, um, and it was given to, to Crow for this work, allegedly because of some comments that he very publicly made which were extremely critical of the political establishment in post-war Britain. Um, so some things, I guess, never change. And then, um, in 1927, Starling was on board a pleasure cruise on a banana boat in Kingston, Jamaica, and had been ill. He'd actually had a very uh, significant uh, colon resection uh, and had never really fully recovered. I guess this was a sort of a convalescence cruise, but he was found dead on his own uh, in his cabin. There was no autopsy done, and so the actual cause of death, somewhat mysteriously, has never been, uh, never been fully elucidated. He is survived by, uh, by his great-grandson, Boris Starling, who is a, a writer, I believe, of popular fiction. So we're here to celebrate and to think about something scientific in, uh, in Starling's honour. And, and I guess the, the brief for today was to think about uh, IV fluid therapy, specifically to try and... And I'm trying to avoid using the, pu- the 2020 vision pun here, so I'm not going to. Um, but... Some of the questions I think we'll be asking next year and for the next 10 years are likely the same as the questions we've been asking for the last 10. And so specifically, when we think about IV fluid and fluid administration, we ask three questions, uh, type, amount, and increasingly, I think, because a lot of the type and amount work, some people would say, has been done. Well, I don't think all of us would agree with that. But perhaps the way we give fluid is at least as important Um, and maybe more important. One of the things I think is really neat about this last question is is that it's work in the developing world which is teaching us about that. I'm going to make a couple of comments about some fabulous work done in Africa that that I think needs to uh, inspire some some careful uh, questions for us to ask ourselves. So I am going to talk quite a lot about type of fluid, just because that's what I've written the most about, thought the most about, and, I'm, and, and have, at least in a, some small part, contributed to the literature, I think. Um, around about the same time that Starling was figuring out the, uh, the law of the heart, George Evans wrote in JAMA, 
And I'll read these quotes because I think they, they, they speak to the fact that people have been worrying about fluid type for a long time. One cannot fail to be impressed with the danger of the utter recklessness with which salt solutions frequently prescribed, particularly in the post-operative period. How incredibly insightful was that comment? The disastrous role played by the salt solution is often lost in light of the serious condition that calls forth its use. In other words, people blow off the fact that they're just giving a salt solution because the underlying treatment must surely be worse than the disease. Well, not always, as, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see. Um, right back to fluid therapy basics. We know that not all fluids are the same. Not all IV fluids are created equally, and we talk about balanced and unbalanced fluids from the physiological electrolyte composition perspective. If you give a patient fluid with a strong iron difference of zero, eventually their own strong iron difference will become zero. So uh, fluids like 0.9% uh, saline that have a strong iron difference of zero lead to the generation of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And there's been a lot of talk for a long time. How much do you actually have to give, one, to cause metabolic acidosis? Two, is that acidosis harmful? Three, uh, are there specific circumstances where it's particularly bad for you or not? Balanced fluids, however, fluids which maintain a physiological strong iron difference, um, tend not to cause that problem, at least not as severely. So arguably you could give more before that problem would manifest. And there's been a lot of discussion over the past uh, 20, 30, 40, even 100 years about whether or not this is a, th a thing or not a thing. Uh, this is a very famous slide, um, often attributed to me, but it's not mine originally. Actually, I actually saw it first here about, ooh, I don't know, more years than I care to remember. Um, and it points out that there is a lot of salt in a litre of normal saline. But there's a lot of salt in a litre of balanced fluid as well. And so we, we like to use this slide to be dramatic. There's 36 bags of crisps in a litre of normal saline. There's about 30 in a litre of plasmolite or Hartmann's. So it does, it does um, you know, create the initial wow effect. But it's not really where the, where, where the, 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 the true problem is. But 0.9% saline for centuries, or a one century at least, decades, say, has been used as our go-to resuscitation fluid. In the absence of any beneficial data, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, it has equal amounts of sodium and chloride in, 154 milliequivalents per litre. So that's a lot more chloride than we certainly have, a little bit more sodium than, than, than we have. It's not like plasma. And the problem is when you add a litre of normal saline to plasma, you increase the relative plasma concentration of chloride much more than you do the concentration of sodium. And as I said before, that reduces the plasma strong iron difference, leads to the development of a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, and we believe leads to adverse clinical outcomes. That probably is not, and I can't believe I'm saying this, not fully proven yet. And there are two very large trials which I do think will hopefully, uh, one way or another, put the final nail in the coffin here. We'll see. We'll talk a little bit more about these, uh, th this work now, in fact. This is Dilip Lobo, who is a professor of surgery in Nottingham. He has done a series of, uh, of, of very fine interventional studies in healthy volunteers. Well, they're, I guess they're Nottingham medical students. I guess they're healthy volunteers. But the, uh, these are crossover studies using the same volunteers as their own controls. In this particular study, he compared the use of a balanced crystalloid solution, a 0.9% saline, measuring on the left blood flow in the renal cortex using MRI and the same uh, technique uh, to measure total renal artery blood flow on the right. And you can see in the balanced fluid group uh, or, or uh, arm of the study, there's a clear reduction in total renal blood flow and renal cortical blood flow, which you don't see when the subjects are given uh, plasma light. In fact, you see a slight increase in both, as you would expect with, uh, with, with circulating volume expansion. So if this happens in, in healthy 21-year-old know, volunteers, imagine the impact on the kidneys of 85-year-old uh, uh, patients with a fractured neck of femur who normally run a blood pressure of 195 over 110. And the significance, we believe, although this is not proven, we believe uh, 
if there is a hazard with high chloride solutions, it's related in some way to its effect on endothelial function. This is a, an isolated uh, in vitro PrEP, clearly demonstrating within the physiological concentration of serum chloride that there is an effect on arteriolar vasoconstriction. It's not the whole answer, though, because a lot of the, or some of the observational work and some of the interventional work does not show a link between high chloride concentrations and renal hazard, but most of it does. There is clearly something else which may or probably is related to differential um, uh, immune activity, which I'm not going to get into. Nevertheless, there is clear physiological examples from the in vitro literature and the in vivo literature that increasing serum chloride concentration causes arteriolar vasoconstriction. Um, Back in... I don't know when did we present this, 2011 maybe? I can't remember. Um, on this stage, um, I showed these data, which we then published in the uh, surgical literature, that for the, we think for the first time asked the question, is there a link between unbalanced fluid administration and surgical complications? This is a, a retrospective study using the Premier data set in um, 2,778 patients given saline matched to 926 patients given balanced fluid. It's a one to three propensity score match um, using fairly conventional epidemiological techniques to try and minimize the risk of observable confounding. Obviously, it doesn't, it doesn't control for unobservable confounding and it doesn't control for failure to advance the slides. Right, there we go. Anyway, the point was in that study we observed a fairly consistent association between adverse clinical outcomes and use of saline for resuscitation on the day of major abdominal surgery. The composite is statistically significant uh, and it's driven by the incidence of uh, major infection. We also noticed a significant increase in therapeutic (coughs) interventions designed to treat or ameliorate the effects of acidosis, so more bicarbonate, more blood, more blood gases taken, uh, more lactic acid levels, more dialysis. Interestingly, this was new dialysis. And back then we were uh, obsessed with the idea that this is all renal, it's all renal. Um, And then we did this study, and this is Karthik Raganathan, who is a colleague and friend of mine at Duke. Um, And we asked the question, is there a similar signal in critically ill adults with sepsis, not surgical patients. And is there, a, is there a signal that people will really believe, like mortality? And it turns out there is. And I love this graph from Karthik's paper where he demonstrates that there is an apparent relationship between dose and outcome. That's mortality on the left. Uh, and, and on the X axis is the percentage of the fluid given in the first two days that is balanced. So over here on the right, everybody's getting balanced fluid. Over here on the left, nobody is. And you can see there's a fairly clear relationship between the amount of or the percentage of fluid that's balanced and, uh, and outcome. And so we thought, OK, that's good. Now, I remember vividly the speaker after me was... Scott Beatty, who is a a professor of anesthesiology, very smart guy, great investigator in Toronto. Uh, And and as you can see, Domingo Widgesandera is also a member of this team. And Scott presented these these data, and neither of us knew um, at all that the other one was going to stand up and present the the, the information they did. So Scott presented this study that they had just, uh, Stuart had just finished, where they matched um, 4,200 patients who became hyperchloremic in the hospital, who'd had major non-cardiac surgery, with a similar cohort who had not become hyperchloremic. And they demonstrated a fairly classical epidemiological J-curve, demonstrating an association between observed in-hospital maximum serum chloride and mortality. Interestingly, the effect is, starts to become apparent on the low side as well, but it really takes off on the high side. By the time your serum chloride, for example, after surgery is up to 125, you've got an 18 19% chance of dying in the hospital. So we thought that was cool. <clears throat> so we went back to a different data set, um, the Cerner Health Facts data set, and asked the question, can we reproduce that finding? But rather than asking the question, is there a link between observed serum chloride? Is there a link between administered chloride and outcome? And can we control 
for the amount of volume that that chloride is delivered in. Because you could say, for example, it's nothing to do with chloride, it's just about the volume. We know, we know, we know a lot of stuff that actually we don't know is, uh, is actually volume uh, related. So we developed this variable, the exposure variable, volume adjusted chloride load, whereby we measure the total amount of chloride administered, the Cerner data set has that, and we divide it by the amount of volume in which it's administered. And we think we had a fairly did a fairly good job of reproducing um, McCluskey's signal. Um, you can see that by the time, on the right-hand side here, by the time you're getting 1,500 milliequivalents of, uh, of chloride, that's 10 litres of normal saline. Now, you can also see the confidence interval splay out, so that means there's relatively few patients out there. Well, that's how I would argue that's a good sign. But the, 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 the reproduction of that signal and exp- uh, um, effect size we thought was pretty convincing. So remember, this is a different type of patient, but it's, it's the same relationship. This is administered chloride. So we thought the circumstantial evidence was pretty good at this point. Um, this is another paper in the anesthesiology literature a year later in which Karthik demonstrated the same signal uh, actually worsened if you add colloid in. We're going to talk a little bit about colloid in a minute. Um, yeah. And, and we just did this to see, you know, can colloid either rescue a hazard or worsens it? Turns out uh, it actually worsens it, as you may or may not be surprised. Now, meanwhile, in Australia, um, this group, um, uh, the principal investigator of which is UNOS, we're asking a, a, an interesting question. If we remove access to high chloride solutions, can we, through time, can we detect an appreciable ha- a renal hazard? And they did. Um, this, is the, this is actually not the figure from JAMA because the figure in JAMA has these curves wrongly labelled, which I love to tease Ronaldo about, who's the senior author on this study every time. But the point is that in the epoch of time during which high chloride solutions were not available to the guys in this unit, there was a reduction in the incidence of acute kidney injury. Now, there was a subsequent follow-on paper that talked about competing risks and other things that were going on in that time that really maybe perhaps clouded the, the clarity of this signal, but added to the totality of the circumstantial evidence. And remember, this isn't just observational. This is an interventional trial, albeit not a prospective randomized trial. But nevertheless, it adds to the substance of the argument. So summarize all of this. I'll, I'll, I'll show you an extract of the literature that saline is bad. This is just the 40 papers that would happen to fit on this slide. There are more. There is now and I'll show you in a minute some uh, interventional uh, data that underscores the effect that saline is bad. But because it's important to show balance, I will now I'll show you the totality of the literature that saline is good for you. And I think, you know, this, this, is, this is... I do this to be dramatic, obviously, but the point is that even now, when people have been trying hard to find some evidence of benefit, there still isn't any at least to my knowledge. If there is, please find me afterwards so I can change that slide. This is a cool trial. This is a pilot trial done by the uh, ANZIX Clinical Trials Group led by Paul Young uh, at, uh, at the time. Dr. Myberg is on this uh, study. He's in the audience today. And the split trial was a pilot trial to ask the question, is this is, is a comparison of... Um, balanced and saline feasible in the intensive care unit. They demonstrated they couldn't find a difference in dialysis or acute kidney injury, but did report a non-significant but potentially important mortality signal. And if you look at the odds ratios on the right here, you'll see that there's a, for, for death in the hospital, there's a apparent signal consistent anywhere between a 33% reduction and a 17% increase. And one of the things I think that the people investigating this space have in common is the importance of considering the size of the effect, the direction of the effect, and not to get obsessed by p-values. I hope some of our work has demonstrated you can drive a p-value to basically zero if you have enough patients. That's not the important uh, point, and, and I think sometimes that gets missed a bit. So this led on to the development and the design of the PLUS trial, which is now ongoing, um, and we await the results of that uh, uh, with with interest. My understanding is that is a significantly sicker population who are receiving a significantly larger amount of fluid. I think it's the nice sugar inclusion population. 
uh, and so we look forward to those results with interest. At the same time at Vanderbilt, we were running a similar sort of concept pilot program with a different uh, emphasis. We were trying to figure out whether or not we could use a cluster crossover design to get at this problem. So we, this is the SALT trial. This is uh, 974 patients admitted to the medical ICU at Vanderbilt, uh, about half of whom were assigned to, to um, saline and half were assigned to a balanced crystallite uh, mixture. So this is a cluster crossover. I'll talk a bit more about that in the context of the SMART trial, which is what this trial was designed to figure out. We were also seeing whether or not we could use the EMR both to allocate treatment and also to record the outcome. And John Wanderer, who's on all of these papers, is, a, is an electronics wizard who wrote most of the code to do this. And none of this work would be possible without his uh, expertise. SALT also was negative from an overall... I shouldn't say negative. We shouldn't talk about positive and negative trials. The, there wasn't a difference in MAKE30 overall for the, um, for the uh, comparison but there is a clear signal out in the high volume administrations. There's a difference in, uh, out over here at 8, 9, 10 uh, litres. But there's very few patients out in that arm. Nevertheless, we did manage to administer the intervention using uh, the CPOE uh, environment at Vanderbilt. That's computerised physician order entry. So if you ordered saline and it was a balanced month, the patient still got balanced, in other words. And we used the EMR to extract the information around MAKE30, which I'll talk about next. And we believe that there was enough uh, of a signal there to go ahead and, and do these two trials, which are SMART and SALT-ED. We published the designs of these studies in advance. Um, here is the design of those trials. This is SMART and SALT-ED. This is the allocation for the SMART trial, which was done between 2015 summertime and spring 2017. Um, the primary endpoint in SMART was MAKE30, which is a composite of death, new dialysis, and persistent renal dysfunction at 30 days, defined as a doubling, a persistent doubling in your serum creatinine. And SALT-ED had the primary outcome of hospital-free days. And you can see the way this works was these are the five intensive care units at Vanderbilt Adult uh, Hospital. And each unit was randomly assigned to start with either saline or balanced fluid. That's the only randomization in the trial, whether or not you started with the one or the other. Now, mercifully, it worked out. If all of these units had been randomized to start with one fluid, the same fluid, we would not have had enough fluid in the hospital to do this trial. So that was a bit of luck, but it's better to be lucky than good. And you can see that each month, as you're admitted to any of these ICUs, the fluid you get is either balanced this month or saline the next month. And for those surgical units, which is neuro, cardiac, and trauma, and surgical, the uh, fluid given in the operating rooms that fed those intensive care units was also saline or balanced. And it took us quite a lot of sales work and a lot of pizza to get people to buy into that. There was a lot of, uh, of, of, of installed bias, if you will. Um, and and it, in fact, it turned out I had, to, I had to lead the charge in the cardiac unit because the cardiac anesthesia group were absolutely insistent that no one was going to get saline. And in the end, I said, can you at least give the first two litres of saline and then switch? And then they said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm giving them all saline because my you know, need to know outweighs my own installed bias against saline. And that was what flipped the switch for them. But the point is, is that this is a cluster crossover trial where everybody's in, regardless of of, uh, of when or how you come to the hospital. And we think that that carries some um, external validity. One of the really cool things, I think, about those two trials, that we didn't just publish the statistical analysis plan. We actually embedded the code, the R code, as a LaTeX file behind the protocol in, in the paper. And we had run this code on extracts of data pulled out of our EMR using a historical cohort. So we knew that it worked. And, and, and anybody who wants to completely reproduce and, 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 uh, and, and, I guess, repeat SMART or SALT-ED can get hold of this code uh, and use it to run, run the same analysis. Um, we published both of these trials on February the 27th last year. 
uh, in the same edition of the New England Journal. Uh, Matt Semler, who is now, I guess, a risen star in this space, is a very smart investigator. He's a pulmonary intensivist, and he carried a pager for the entire time answering questions from multiple sources. I'll talk about smart first, but all of the credit really for this trial should go to Matt Semler. As I said, John Wanderer, who, who wrote the code that, uh, that allowed the EMR to be the, the, you know, the driver of the trial. The major adverse kidney events was the primary outcome. I've talked about that, death, dialysis, and persistently uh, elevated serum creatinine. 16,000 patients came into five ICUs. They were then, as I said earlier on, randomized to start with either salt or plasma light or LR, actually. It wasn't just a plasma light versus salt study. And you can see of those 15,904, 15,802 made it to the primary analysis. And the uh, allocation of saline and balanced fluid was almost exactly equal. Good separation of exposure. We think that's really important. Um, But look at the total volume given. Really not very much at all. And when we started to see this, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be a disaster. We haven't given enough. Um, mercifully there are enough patients who did get a significant amount of volume that there was a signal which I'll show you in a minute but there's very clear separation interestingly despite having a system which essentially guarantees that the fluid administered is one sort or another you can see that even in the balance group you know people are getting Five, six hundred, seven hundred cc's of saline. Same in the other in the other group. But we thought that this was reasonably good evidence that our exposures were different enough in the two groups. There was uh, detectable uh, biochemical separation between the two groups. And people used to say to me, "Is two liters enough?" Obviously not. And now I say, "Well, apparently, because all you could argue about whether or not this is a significant difference." But it's clearly a difference between both bicarbonate levels and serum chloride levels in the, in the two arms. And there was a statistically significant difference between the composite of death, new dialysis, persistent renal dysfunction in the two arms. And the difference is driven by the mortality signal. Um, and we think that's significant, about a 1% delta. So that's a number needed to treat. If you like that, if you don't, I apologize, of about 94. With a specific uh, call out for sepsis, where the signal may be significantly larger, and the traumatic brain injury group, where there's a significant, uh, uh, I'll say, hesitation to recommend a balanced fluid. And I don't think that that discussion is fully uh, solved yet. Salt ED, Wes Self, uh, probably the smartest ER doc I've ever had the privilege to learn from. He uh, is a sort of an ER version of Matt Semler, and he ran the Salt ED trial. Same group, same design. A um, little bit different in the sense that the crossover here is, is there's only one emergency room, which was the adult emergency room at Vanderbilt. The included population are people who got 500 cc's of isotonic fluid and were hospitalised but outside the ICU. Why outside the ICU? Because if you went to the ICU, you went into SMART. Um, So it's a pragmatic single cluster, multiple crossover trial. Same sort of time period. Actually, we started a little bit later, if you look, in January 2016, but finished up at the same time. The outcome here was a composite of in-hospital death and length of stay, which we like. Uh, and it's hospital-free days in the first 28. If you die in the hospital, that variable is coded as zero, and it's basically 28 <coughs> minus the length, total length of stay in the hospital. So it's a composite of death, length of stay, and includes readmissions. So we think it captures that stuff. And the, pri- the first secondary outcome, if you will, was the same make 30 composite that I just told you about in SMART. Uh, 20,000 patients came to the ED and were treated with 500 cc's at least of isotonic fluid and were admitted. Of those, uh, 13,500 uh, made it into SALT ED, and about, again, the allocation was about half and half. Again, the same sort of difference in biochemical um, variables uh, in, in, in the study. Um, and uh, no difference whatsoever in the hospital free days, adjusted odds ratio of 0.98, so essentially the same. But the first secondary, as I said, was the same make 30. That was statistically significant. 
much less frequent, about a third as frequent, because these patients are a lot less sick, remember. And now the difference in the composite is driven by a different component. It's now driven by persistent renal dysfunction. There's been a lot of discussion about why that is. We think it's because they're not as sick. Patients in SMART died before they could manifest that um, persist persistent doubling in serum creatinine. But it's one of the, I guess, you know, flaws in the, or flies in the, in the SMART salt ED ointment, if you, if you will. So taken together, we think that among non-critically ill patients in the ED, uh, this is the SALT ED uh, conclusion, no difference in hospital-free survival, but a lower incidence of MAKE 30. And weighed together, the fact that um, the cons there was a consistent reduction in this composite, albeit driven by a different component, uh, has uh, positive and negative aspects. Here is the Smart Salt ED team standing outside the door of the Vanderbilt Medical School. And, and one of the things I think, regardless of whether you believe the information or not, what we did manage to do here was demonstrate that relatively quickly you can really inform a clinical question by using designs that, that feature aspects of a learning healthcare system. So it's based in the EMR, it's pragmatic, it's done in a real-world setting. Uh, the, the CRF was, was really minimal. Um, 30,000 patients, and, and we think, as I said, um, the health R system, the healthcare system, that should say, it leverages the power of the fact that if you could embrace a, commu a clinical community to get on board, you can answer questions or at least inform that decision really, really quickly. All right, enough about the type of fluid, type of crystalloid anyway. Let's talk about colloid and ask, is it dangerous? So 10 years ago now, Frank Brunkhorst presented and published the VICEPS study, which was a small randomized controlled trial. Factorial design, hyperchloremic, hyperoncotic starch prep compared to against lactated ringers and a big dose, 17 mils per kilo. And apparently it appears to be a dose response for both renal replacement therapy and for mortality at 90 days. You can see that as the volume of HES administered increases, so does the risk of dialysis and death, and that doesn't seem to be the same for the crystalloid. There's been a lot of controversy and criticism about VICEP, but the fact remains that that was the, the dose response, for me at least, was the compelling, uh, compelling argument. Um, four years later, the 6S group, led by Anders Perner, a Danish anaesthetist intensivist, compared HES 130.4 versus Ringer's acetate, which is the widely used balanced crystalloid solution in their country, and demonstrated a statistically significant survival hazard associated with administration of HES 130.4. And I think, again, for me, the really important thing here was that the hazard appears to be late. If you just look in the first week as the... Um, approval trials did, you will miss this hazard. And I think that was really significant. At the same time, uh, this paper was published in CHESS by Dr. M Professor Myberg. Uh, the CHESS trial, extensively discussed, extensively criticised, reanalyzed, and the original results confirmed. Although no statistically significant survival difference, these curves never change. And you could argue that given the likely effect size, this trial wouldn't, wasn't powered to, discuss, to discover that, but a positive signal in terms of dialysis. And I think a lot of people have pretty much decided that the, uh, uh, the days of uh, hydroxyethyl starch are over, certainly in the intensive care unit, although there is a body of thought in the operating room that, that is not ready to let that go yet. There was a lot of regulatory activity following 6S and CHEST, and most places around the world, although not all, issued regulatory restrictions, either completely removing it from um, the clinical environment or severely restricting it, but not everywhere. So what are the colloid alternatives to HES? There's gelatin not available everywhere, not available in North America, for example. Dextrans, we don't use those anymore because of anaphylactic uh, risk. And so that leaves us with albumin. So what to, what to make of albumin? Uh, the SAFE trial showed no increased risk of mortality in critically ill patients with the use of albumin as compared to normal saline, led by the SAFE study investigators in 2004, so almost eight years before CHEST, Simon Finfer, the first author, 
And in a nutshell, uh, SAFE taught us that albumin is equivalent to saline in heterogeneous populations of ICU patients, although many would say it's unclear whether or not now we know whether saline is the ideal comparator. We learned that albumin may be bad in head injury. We learned that albumin may be good in sepsis. What we didn't learn is whether or not that's a tonicity thing or a thing related to the molecule or the preparation. And I think those questions in some parts of the world are ongoing. Here is Luciano uh, Gattinoni. He was the leader of the Albios study in 2014. These guys asked a slightly different question, and they said, if we pose a therapeutic target for albumin of 30 grams per litre, 3 grams per deciliter, can we demonstrate a survival advantage? And at 90 days, although there's an apparent difference, if you showed my uh, 20-year-old musician's son, are these the same lines? He'd say, no, they're not, Dad, but statistically, of course, they are. The question is, was the target high enough, or is this, in fact, a true finding? Here's Jalali Anan. He published uh, the CRYSTAL trial. Uh, this was very controversial, because although the primary endpoint, which was 28-day mortality uh, in ICU patients treated with colloid or crystalloid and hypovolemia was not statistically different. The 90-day mortality was lower in patients receiving colloid. Uh, and the uh, editors rightfully so made them uh, focus on the primary outcome, which was the pre-specified outcome, and said that this finding needs to be considered exploratory. Although I can tell you at the time, these guys thought this was anything but exploratory. But... Um, the editorial team at JAMA were not having any of that. So in, I think in concert, safe success, chest crystal albius, none of them really suggest a clear benefit for colloid over crystalloid. And I think most people, certainly I hope most people, would believe there is a hazard associated with colloid use in the ICU. And that's why it's really important to have a full understanding of the physiology of crystalloid fluids. Not just the physiology, but their real clinical effects in all of their doses. This is the single commonest inpatient prescription. So it's not, just not knowing isn't okay. We have to know. Uh, and um, I hope that's, that, that, that's apparent in the, uh, in, from the talk. Here is uh, Yoon Ho Lee. He published a double-blind, randomized controlled trial, admittedly in a single center, in a small number of off-pump coronary patients where they asked the question, is, if three grams in the Albios trial was wrong, is four grams a better therapeutic target? And, um, and so they drove uh, card- off-pump cardiac surgical patients' albumin up to four and demonstrated a reduction in acute kidney injury. And we wrote an editorial about that. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, the albumin renal literature, because there's the there's signal on both sides. Some people will tell you it's harmful. Some people know different. Some people will benefit. So we did another retrospective trial. This is Adam Kingeter, who was another fellow of mine, who asked the question, um, how about on-pump surgery? Is there an association between outcome and the inclusion of, uh, of albumin in the pump prime? And so we matched um, about a little over 1,000 patients going on-pump for cab and or valve surgery uh, who received albumin, this is 5% actually, uh, against those who received crystalloid only, asking primary endpoint, hospital mortality, and secondary endpoints, organ dysfunction and and hospital readmission. Um, And there apparently was a signal um, related to index mortality and readmission. The trend of all of these point estimates is on the side favouring albumin, but the uh, renal signal crosses unity, as does the major morbidity composite. So take that for what uh, what it's worth. One thing I do know is that the the delta of the effect is nowhere near enough to justify a 10x or 20x or 30x price difference. And I think the onus is on the albumin um, proponents to demonstrate why we should pay 35 times the price for it. So that's enough about type of fluid. God, the time has really gone. All right, I'll pick it up. Sorry. Um, How much fluid? Is fluid amount important? You all know this, lady. You've all either done this or you've received this patient in the ICU. Um, when you give people too much fluid, we don't really know how much too much is, uh, things swell. And their anatomical 
location determines how that manifests clinically. If you are an organ encased in a hard box like the brain or the kidney, say, then it's important. Some of us believe that the same sort of physiology applies inside the, the firm uh, fascia around the kidney as applies in, inside the brain for the pressure volume relationships. But generally speaking, when things become swollen, they don't work as well. It doesn't matter what that structure is. This is a study from uh, John Prowl, who is an intensivist in East London, who basically demonstrated at this point he published this all of the evidence uh, of the studies that compares fluid restriction against more liberal approaches in the ICU favours the restrictive arm. Here is a study from the SOAP group characterising somewhere between a 13 and a 28% increased mortality risk per litre per day that a patient in the ICU with renal failure becomes positive. But that's all fine. Here's a really cool trial. This is Paul Miles' work published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, the RELIEF trial. Restrictive versus liberal fluid therapy for patients undergoing major abdominal surgery. 3,000 of them, liberal or restrictive. But the primary out- this is a really cool primary outcome. Disability-free survival at one year. And I'm going to talk a bit about that, make a comment in a minute. And then typical other secondaries, renal function, um, dialysis, morbidity. And the primary outcome, there was no difference in disability-free survival, 82% versus 82%, for a liberal group that got 6 litres and a restrictive group that got 3.7 litres. But more organ dysfunction in the restrictive group, all statistically significant. So two comments here. One, it's not okay just to drive people to a squeeze. But I think, more importantly, we are failing one in five general surgical patients. Right? What am I talking about? So the incidence of DFS is only 80%. That means one in five patients were either disabled or dead. That's not cool. I think that's really important, and we should definitely be able to do better. Trust someone like Paul Miles to point that out. Um, so that's a little input from the randomized controlled trial literature about amounts. So clearly the amount of fluid that we give is important. We just don't know exactly how to do that. So Paul will tell you to be moderately liberal uh, as you approach in, uh, fluid. Um, and as I said, we don't know the sweet spot, but the point is, we, we, if, if, this was, if fluid was an antibiotic or a chemotherapeutic agent, and we said, well, we don't really know what the right dose is, we wouldn't be allowed to use it. Yet instead, this is the single commonest thing we do to inpatients. What about how we give fluid? How is that important? Here's the FEAST trial. Kath Maitland, Professor Kath Maitland, published this paper in the New England Journal, June 30th, 2011. 3,141 African children who were febrile with impaired perfusion, predominantly because of malaria. And the intervention here was a bolus of albumin versus a bolus of saline versus no bolus, with a primary outcome of 48-hour mortality. And to everyone's amazement, certainly at the time, and there's been a lot of discussion, in fact, recently there's been some discussion in the pulmonary literature about this. I think Professor Marburg wrote an editorial about some of the physiology behind this. Um, if you were given albumin or saline as a bolus, you did really badly compared to if you just had no bolus. So the way that these kids were given their fluid mattered. Here's a trial, again, from Matt Semler and Ben Andrews and, and a group of investigators in an emergency room in Zambia studying predominantly HIV-positive patients with sepsis and hypotension, where the treatment protocol was compared against usual care. Basically, that meant fluid and dopamine against no fluid or dopamine. And here, protocolized therapy uh, killed more people than the regular treatment. So that's not great. And it's a big effect highly statistically significant. So the way that we give fluid is really important. We need to learn from these studies in lower and middle income countries that don't have ongoing intensive care units to salvage people from harm that we cause. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that either. I think that's, that's a, really, um, a really salient point. I think the fundamental problem is that we measure volume responsiveness and we think that's the same as volume deficiency and it clearly isn't. And we don't have technology to measure volume responsiveness, although we will soon have. 
this is technology coming to the marketplace within the next probably 18 months or so that uses indicator clearance to measure plasma volume. And you can see I've highlighted here. Here's the measured plasma volume in this patient. Nadler's estimated volume is almost identical. And you use the hematocrit to measure uh, uh, blood volume as well. This is available and, 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 uh, and will be available for use in semi-real time, which means you have to you give one in, dose of indicator and then you can draw repeated measurements over the next six to eight hours using optical technology. So we'll soon know what someone's absolute circulating volume is. And I'm going to finish with this, because this is really cool. This is the best name of an IV fluid that you're going to hear. This is a paper in maybe even this month or last month's anesthesia. And congratulations to anesthesia and the association for a way cool new impact factor of 5.8, I think it is. This is work from Lara Ola, who is a Spanish anesthetist. And uh, she has patented a fluid called OxyLife. Uh, and this is a study in a, in a hemorrhagic shock model in pigs that purports to improve oxygen distribution to tissues via microcirculatory um, uh, physiological benefit. But I'm not entirely sure how this is going to take off, because if you look at the composition, this has got, this is pretty odd. It's got 128 mill, millimoles of sodium, so it's hyponatremic. It's profoundly hyperchloremic, 164. And it's got some small uh, nitrates and nitrites and a ton of, of trace elements as well. So look out for Oxy Life. It's going to come to a cl clinical trial unit near you. So I'm going to wrap up now and, and, and suggest to you that fluid is toxic. So please give the least you need to get the job done. I believe the evidence that high chloride solutions are harmful is convincing. Why they are is much, much less clear. There are no data suggesting saline is beneficial. There are now two big pragmatic trials in more than 30,000 patients <coughs> suggesting that the initial fluid choice should probably be balanced in most clinical situations. BASICS, which is a large volume administration trial being run in Brazil, and the PLUS trial in Australia and New Zealand will inform the large volume administration question and I hope answer it. Whether albumin is beneficial I think is unclear, but the substantial price difference means that its routine use is not yet made. And the way we do this is really important, and I think we need to learn from these incredible investigators that do these difficult trials uh, in, in the emerging um, countries. To, uh, we need to learn from them and, uh, and see if their data, in fact, truly carries over into our setting. So with that, thank you very much, Professor Starling. Thank you very much, Professor Mythen and Grocott. And, uh, and I'm sorry to keep you late. Thanks very much. Dave Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Dot com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.